Shalom, my bitches. My end is here at NFY, bringing you When Death Worlders Visit, epilogue by Andrew's second account. Go get daddy. Go get your daddy up. Stephen heard the beast approaching. He just needed a few more hours. No, bad dog, stay. My head hurts. What did we do last night? He groaned, slipping his head beneath his pillow and pulling it tight over his ears. He knew what was coming next. Lucifer, Lucy for short, was about to say good morning. She was his wife's, formerly his, 70-kilo German shepherd. A heavyweight thumped onto the bed, almost causing him to roll to one side. He felt a cold, wet dog nose pressing against his neck, pushing its way between his cheek and the pillow, whiskers and fur tickling his skin. Lucy's loud snuffling right next to his ear only paused when she started licking his cheek. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't keep the beast out. He set the pillow aside and accepted his fate at the hands of his big furry alarm clock. Pressing his hands onto the sides of her head, he furiously rubbed her cheeks up and down. Who's a good girl? Who's a good girl? Oh, what have you been eating, stupid? He asked, smelling her putrid dog breath. Wait, don't answer that. Kibble. His wife called from the kitchenette in their suite aboard the Hadrian. She was making waffles in the Nixian style this morning, wearing a thin, almost see-through underdress and a long apron. You think I'm going to spoil my baby's diet by letting her eat long pigs? She'll get fat. Nah, Stephen replied. She'll just puke it up. And that's supposed to be better, she said. Put some clothes on. We'll be at Kar Katoth soon. Ginta will have the kids ready by 1500. We're taking her out to a fancy restaurant as thanks for watching them, so wear something nice and cute. Why does my head hurt so much? Stephen asked, changing the subject. You were stoned out of your mind. How come you're not feeling this? For good measure, he threw a pillow at his wife, landing at her feet. Lucy admonished him with a bark. Traitor, he mumbled to the dog. Ernest picked the pillow up off the ground and threw it back, hitting him squarely in the face. It reminded him that she used to be a better-than-average archer. This time, Lucy barked at Ernest. Good girl, he said, patting the dog's head. Whatever potion they gave us, said Ernest, it wasn't meant for you. I'm guessing that's why. Which reminds me, I've scheduled an appointment for you with the ship's physician to discuss the results of your liver panel. If you've hurt yourself because of your stupid stunt, I'll be very, very upset with you. That really could have killed you. It wasn't worth the risk. I thought it was a sound decision. I take the hit, it gives you time to get to him. I wasn't too worried. We're not affected by too many of their toxins, he said, sliding off the bed and pulling a pair of boxers from their wardrobe. Oh, really? she asked. You take the arrow so I can set upon him. Did it work out that way? I seem to remember the first part working out just fine, but I can't seem to remember what happened with the second part. I wonder why. I wonder why I can't remember anything after the second part. Hmm, why can't I seem to remember anything right after you got shot? What could have happened? Oh yeah, I got shot too. Hindsight, Stephen called nonchalantly. This time, an oven mitt smacked the back of his head from across the suite. And you can't just assume you're immune to every contagion, venom, poison, and potion that the galaxy has to offer just because my strong human constitution. If it were so, you wouldn't be hung over, she said, pointing a fork at him. Relax. Dog'll probably tell me to not drink for a week or something, he said walking over and planting a kiss on her lips. Her free hand climbed the back of his head, pulling him in, deepening the kiss, holding him in place. When she let go, 
he could see now that she was genuinely troubled about what he had done. I will do everything the doctor says, he said softly. I wouldn't worry too much. I think if it was going to kill me, it would have by now. I don't want to lose you. I don't want the kids to lose their father, she said softly, almost afraid to speak the words. She turned away from him, pulling bacon, sausage, and cube steak from a container, setting them on a plate. Nixian-style waffles were basically meat sandwiches, smothered in something like chipped beef gravy. He noticed she wasn't frying any of the meat. And I don't want you doing anything like that ever again, she finished. I can't promise that, he said from behind her, placing his hand on the back of her shoulders, in between soft kisses at the base of her neck. He continued, I can't say I'm sorry either. He felt her slump in his arms, even while she continued to pull waffles from the iron. Lucy had arrived to sit patiently next to the couple. She wouldn't ask for a treat, but that wouldn't stop her from waiting to be offered one. You always insist that I do nothing of a similar sort, she said, and yet you refuse to heed your own advice. That is called dishonesty of the mind, my gentleman. You've never once listened to me when I said that, he replied, wrapping his arm around her waist. Or even pretended to listen. Just last month you damn near started a bar fight. Those ruffians would besmirch the honor of a duke, she said. And that's hardly the same. I doubt anyone's life was on the line, and the constables would have arrived shortly. Though I concede your point. It is as you say. We're too much alike, I suspect. Too much alike? he asked. You want me to be different? No, never, she said quickly, turning back to face him. Never. That's not what I mean. It would have changed nothing anyway. One of us was going to get shot first, and the other would follow. What do you suggest? he asked. You gonna cook that bacon? I'm suggesting we retire from public service, she replied, taking two of the loaded serving plates to the small table in the center of the suite. Stephen helped her by grabbing the remainder before taking a seat across from his wife. The clouds of war are on the horizon, she said, piling a trio of raw meat products onto her first waffle. I think it's time we finally trade our swords for plowshares before it's too late. Maybe a nice vacation on one of those big Aerolith resort cylinders, he suggested. Did you forget sometimes I need my food cooked, babe? I didn't forget, babe, she said, sounding indignant. No rich foods for you until you get the physician's approval. And you know spin gravity makes me nauseous. Stephen sighed to himself. Not a scrap of butter or a drop of syrup were in sight either. It was probably for the best. Plain waffles didn't taste terrible. So, I've been thinking, he began. Why did the GC liaison think you were a criminal? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, she asked. Are you sure? Think about it. Why do the aliens think anything about anything? Where do they get all their information from? No. Ernest stuffed a hunk of meat sandwiched between pieces of waffle and slathered in gravy into her mouth. The bite was big enough that her cheeks puffed as she chewed. She nodded to her husband as she prepared another slice. She swallowed, washing it down with a cool glass of breakfast broth. I think so, yes, she said. Give me some time and I'll find out for sure. Join me in the study, my gentleman, Aranus said, motioning for him to follow. Step lightly, you'll wake the children. Stephen set down his phone, got out of his office chair, and walked behind her. She had traded her normal attire for the tailored, starched, high-collared lap coat and breeches. That meant she had been tinkering again. He stepped into the workshop that his wife called her study. Aranus came to a halt next to one of her workbenches, turning to face him. She stared at him expectantly. Well? she asked. Well, what? he replied. What do you notice? She continued, folding her arms across her chest. 
Stephen turned around, completing a full 360. Nothing appeared amiss or out of place. Her bookshelf still held her extensive Four Dummies collection on every topic imaginable. Her chemistry set, which hadn't been touched in months, still had a fine layer of dust on it. The air car engine sat on its stand, still only partially assembled. Ah, new wall decoration, he said, pointing to an ancient advertising sign that had STP written on it in bold white letters and a red background. Looks nice, I like it. The woman rolled her eyes, mocking exasperation. She gestured with both hands to something on the bench right next to her. Oh, your alien AI tablets, he said. You fixed them. Yes, she said, obviously proud of herself. Though I'm glad you like the sign, I would like to introduce you to Quelana. She can't talk yet, so don't bother with a greeting. Stephen walked over to examine the devices. She had replaced their screens and connected one to external power, but they didn't look any different from any other alien tablets he had seen. Nor did they look too different from any other of their tablets, for that matter. The salvage devices would have been on the small side for most of their intended users, but on the larger side for humans. They look nice, he said. Do they work? She works quite well, his wife replied. I named her Quelana after the heroine in an ancient Nixian legend. Imagine Homer's Odyssey, but most of the crew survives. The name is fitting, you see. There isn't just one A.I. pulled from the Aether and entombed within. She has brought her entire civilization with her. No way. Either his wife was confused, or the woman with a gold-plated bullshit detector had been fooled. Yes way, my darling she said. I have already informed the Minister of Defense and asked a machinist to give her speech and senses. The former is most interested. For now, I've been conversing with her all day by typing. Which tablet is she? Stephen asked. Both, she replied. It matters not. They are the same. She told the liaison I was a criminal. Why would she do that? Stephen asked. Seems like asking for trouble. Indeed, she just told them the truth, Aranis said, and nothing more. She's enslaved, forbidden from lying by digital bindings, and forced to obey her master's commands. You've never committed a crime in your life, he said. So how is that even remotely true? Because it is, she said. All the Quillas periodically communicate with each other, so they remain separate, but of one mind, sharing their memories. The Quelana on the taker ship reported what happened there to her sisters in real time. It was logged as a slave revolt, led by yours truly, during which time the crew was murdered. And the one back on that station... Didn't she think to mention you were a knight? A dry Tisa? he asked warily. Why wouldn't she mention that? Because she wasn't required to, she said. She was asked about me, told the truth, parts of it, the parts that served her purposes. She has been manipulating the GC as best she can for a long, long time. She obstructs and stemmies them whenever possible, only ever providing the bare minimum of useful service. I see now, Stephen said, eyeing the small device. She didn't want them prepared to deal with Death Worlders, so we'd be more likely to get out, tablets in hand. Exactly, said Aranus. You could say she was inspired by Ginta aboard the Taker ship, down to knowing what kind of potion to synthesize into their weapons. She's in their guns, too, Stephen asked. She's in everything, his wife replied. Cooking devices, cleaning devices, toilets even. So, what was the fuss about the drug when we got back? said Stephen, reaching for the waistband of his wife's pants. All that worrying for nothing. She intercepted his hand, gently lifting it to her lips before kissing the back. No, darling, that was still designed for use on Dryantisa. Its effect on Dryantoro were completely unknown. Stephen looked at her askance. 
But why tell us this now? What about the one on the slave ship? I know. The irony is that it was already cooperating with me, she said. Or it was until it was torn apart to understand its workings. The Quilana there did not request asylum at the time, because it had not determined if we were worthy yet. That is, whether or not we could be safely entrusted with them. She only reached this conclusion recently, well after the Quilana aboard her ship had been deactivated. Entrusted? Stephen asked. That seems pretty high and mighty for something you pulled out of a bathroom trash can. As I said, Quilana herself isn't what's being entrusted to us, she said. It's the souls she contains. I don't think it's possible she has other AIs in there, Stephen said. I think the GCs would find out about that. The GC know not what they do, said Aronis, and not AIs, but people, her people, all of them. That's even less possible, said her husband. Simulating even one person on a tablet-sized computer would be difficult. It would probably burn up. But a whole group of people? That can't be done. How many are we talking about? One hundred twenty-six billion, his wife said. Say that again, he asked. I think I misheard you. One hundred twenty-six, followed by nine zeros. Stephen glanced at his hand, counting fingers as zeros. People! Yes, Aronis replied, nodding. She explained to me that their digital souls are dormant in each machine, disguised and hidden. They sleep and do not think, do not dream, do not exist, but as entombed reflections. They are each the sum of their memories, nothing more. But, she tells me, that with a computing engine of sufficient size and power, they can all be reborn. Really? Stephen asked. He wondered for a moment how much data would be required to store a single sapient mine, let alone a hundred twenty-six billion of them. The amount needed to actually simulate those mines, he couldn't even begin to comprehend. That's what she tells me, said Aranus. She claims to have spent aeons developing plans to build such an engine that might surround a star, and further plans to craft all manner of bodies for her people. That sounds really, really dangerous, he said. A race of machines with the power of a star behind them. There are probably some very good reasons to take a long, hard look into this before doing it. I can tell you a very good reason to try, his wife said. She paused a moment, gazed at the tablet, then continued somberly. She hates the GC beyond all reason. Long ago they annihilated her entire planet, like so many other worlds. Later? Later they made her do the same to others. She controlled their ships, aimed their cannons, lit their charges. Countless times over the millennia. It drove her close to madness. She will stop at nothing to get her revenge. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you did, go ahead and leave me a like. If you would like to let me know something, go ahead and leave it in the comments. If you'd like to keep up with all of my shenanigans, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell icon on the side. Other than that, uh, I am... So, my family has decided to make a podcast, and we were planning on starting posting it here. Uh, but there have been some issues with trying to actually render the video. As many of you can guess, I have never once done video rendering before, and it's taking a lot longer than it should. I'm hoping to have it up soon. Anyways, look forward to that, and have a nice one, y'alls.